Okay, so good morning. Yeah, hope everybody survived the cold weather on the way in. It's no wonder everybody's sick, considering that we're you know, 85 degrees one day, not really 85, but 60 degrees one day. What is it today? Well, we're in, uh, somewhere in there. So we've got one student who's joined the class and was sick, so has to introduce himself. Tell us what his three greatest strengths are, and then attempt to find the work that wants to take them on. Okay. How's it going? My name is Corbin Thurman. Um, I was on the professional sales team in France, so we kind of knew each other last semester. Uh, look forward to taking class with you guys. I was sick with the flu, so didn't want to get anybody else sick. So <laughs> glad to hear that you guys are all doing well. Um, three biggest strengths would be I'm pretty courageous. Um, if you put me in a situation, I'm probably going to perform, not really be too shy about it. Um, I'm pretty good at listening to people, although I could work on it much better than I do. It's always something I like to, to work on. And then uh, my last strength would have to be probably um, my leadership skills. I do have some good leadership skills in certain situations that I like to take and use. So if you guys ever have any questions, don't ever hesitate to talk to me. I'm always up. Um, my name's Corbin. So. Nice to meet you guys. Which group wants for them? Oh, is there anybody? We'll do okay. okay. All right. Remind me at the end of class to put him into your group. So don't let me forget because I have this tendency to uh, forget things. So last time we stopped, according to my notes, if I have this correct, we finished talking, or we hadn't finished talking about correlation. Um, is that what I have? Let's see. We hadn't finished talking about correlation and causation. Yeah, so correlation doesn't equal causation, and we talked about how this is important in marketing, or I started talking about how this is important in marketing. In terms of things like we <clears throat> market drugs in this country, and we're the only nation, uh, we're the only one of two nations, only two, that allow direct consumer advertising of pharmaceutical sales. What does that mean, and why is that necessarily problematic or why might it be problematic well we see all these advertisements let's look at one for drugs i think we looked at one last time which one did we look at we looked at what slow the slow turkey the chantix um let's see what's a good ad for were there any good ads during the super bowl for uh Drug manufacturers and the drug companies have the Super Bowl. I, I did not was, get to see the Super Bowl this year, by the way. One really good, uh, what was it, like, take five Reese's? Take five <laughs> Reese's ad, okay. We'll watch that one in a minute, but let's try and find one with a drug. So there weren't any good drug manufacturing ads. Um, we did Chantix. Um, Mucinix is always a classic. What are, that's, yeah, those are good ads as well. But let's try it. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, this could be one. <laughs> I just know this was on the television all the time. Okay, let's try depression. Here's me, and here's my depression. Before I started taking Abilify, I was taking an antidepressant alone. Most days I could put on a brave face and muddle through, but other days I still struggled with my depression. I was managing, but it always had a way of creeping up on me. I felt stuck. I just couldn't shake my depression. So I talked to my doctor. He said adding Abilify to my antidepressant could help with my depression, and that some people had symptom improvement as early as one to two weeks. He also told me about a free trial offer from Abilify. Now, I feel more in control of my depression. Abilify is not for everyone. Call your doctor if your depression worsens or if you have unusual changes in behavior or thoughts of suicide. Antidepressants can increase these in children, teens, and young adults. Elderly dementia patients taking Abilify have an increased risk of death or stroke. Call your doctor if you have high fever, stiff muscles, and confusion to address a possible life-threatening condition or if you have uncontrollable muscle movements, as these could become permanent. High blood sugar has been reported with Abilify and medicines like it. 
In some cases, extreme high blood sugar can lead to coma or death. Other risks include decreases in white blood cells, which can be serious, dizziness upon standing, seizures, trouble swallowing, and impaired judgment or motor skills. Depression used to define me. Then my doctor added Abilify to my antidepressant. Now, I feel better. If you are still struggling with depression, talk to your doctor to see if the option of adding Abilify is right for you. And be sure to ask about the free trial offer. Abilify. What is the what is the argument that they're making there? What's the argument in the ad that, that they're making? If you take Abilify, you will reduce your symptoms of depression. Okay. If if you are if your current drug therapy is not working well enough for you and you're still suffering from depression, let's take some Abilify. But then we have all of the disclosures, right? Mm -hmm may cause suicidal thoughts and tendencies. Wow, that, that sounds like the opposite, actually, of working on depression. I mean, like, we generally think of things that work on depression as having the opposite. I mean, suicidal thoughts and tendencies sounds to me like, why do you, have you ever known, has there ever been a case of somebody who's overwhelmingly cheerful and they committed suicide? I, I suppose there there was, you know, in the in the range of human existence, that's that's possible. But generally speaking, most people who take their own lives are or clinically depressed, horribly depressed. So they come up with this drug, and again, one of the things that they do to test these drugs is they look at ANOVAs, where they give you a, a a experimental group the drug and a control group not the drug and wow there's a difference yeah it, it turns out some of those people in the experimental group <laughs> had suicidal thoughts and tendencies oh and by the way we're now going to give you another drug to deal with there's have you seen the ads for this now they talked about uncontrollable muscle movements with abilify that's now called tardive dyskinesia, which is brought about by taking all of these drugs. And so now they have a drug that you can take to control the tardive dyskinesia, which is what is tardive, it control, it, it involves uh, your movement of fingers uncontrollably, <clears throat> blinking uncontrollably. I mean, that, you know, so when we make these arguments about correlation, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're causation. The fact that you take Vilify I mean, is that really working? How do we know? We, have, we should be skeptical of these kinds of claims. And one of the things that's happened as a result of ads like this in the United States is that we have people basically self-prescribing. They're going to their doctors, they're seeing these ads, and they're saying things like, my depression is horrible, I need to vilify. You know, I mean, I'm on... Well, butrin and it's not working well enough, so give me a Vilify. Or I'm on Prozac or Paxil or you know any of these other, and I need something else. Well, that may be problematic, particularly in a system in which insurance companies tell doctors that they only have five minutes with you. That's all they'll pay for. Your doctor runs in, they, they don't actually do much. You know, I mean, like, so when you're saying I'm still depressed, and, you know, okay, well, let's try, let's try adding a Vilify. Wow. Well, maybe we ought to think about it. Now, there is a positive side to these ads, I think. And one of those is that we now talk about these things. My father was, he's retired now. He was a special agent in charge for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. At the time he was hired by the FBI. The director of the FBI was J. Edgar Hooper, the founder of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, an enormously powerful man, and somewhat corrupt. Everyone, before they were hired, had to meet the director. Right? And at that point in time, when my father was hired by the FBI, if you had ever been seen by a psychiatrist or a psychologist outside of the Bureau of Psychiatry, they, they would give you, they would, they would have you meet with the psychiatrist or psychologist to make sure that you weren't 
crazy, right? But if you ever met with one before that it was an a priori bar to employment in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, because the theory was you must you must be Looney Tunes. And so during that period, and this was not an abnormal perspective in the 1950s and 60s, to say if you had ever met with a psycho, oh, they, obviously you've got problems, right? Well, I think one of the things that these ads have done is that this has made things like depression and anxiety socially acceptable to talk about, which is a good thing. But there's also maybe a bad part, which is we're all now running to our doctors saying, I need this drug. I want this. You know, I can't quit smoking. Give me Chantix. And what were some of the side effects of Chantix? May cause suicide, may cause, you know, depression. Wow. So we've cured the smoking, but you might take your own life. Uh, you know, it's technically a cure. Well, I, yeah, that is. that's the ultimate cure for a lot of things. You know, death cures a lot. So we need to think about these things when we talk about them, and we need to think about them as marketers and how we are ethically going about presenting the case for the things that we manufacture and the safety of, of those things. So it's not just with regard to drugs. We have this problem and issues with all kinds of things. My department chair is absolutely convinced that Volvo is the most wonderful car on the planet because it's safe, right? It's just a safe car. Are there other safe cars out there? Are there cars that are safer than Volvo? I don't know. Subaru claims that they're safer than Volvo. Are they? How do we evaluate those claims? Subaru has all kinds of ads. You all have seen the ads, you know, with the cars that are crunched and, you know, and they're like, they lived. It's, it's a Subaru ad. They're making an argument about the safety, you know, and the causation between, you know, crashes and you living and surviving in a Subaru. Uh, and so we should be, I think, somewhat skeptical of these things. How do we know that they're safer than Volvo? Or how do we know that Volvo is safer than Subaru? In a highly complex and technical world, that becomes difficult for the average person to evaluate. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, I think we had some ideas. We could evaluate things fairly well. Now, we're going to have to rely on you know, other people and expertise. How many of you could actually work on your own vehicle? Okay, one, two. I've actually done things on my vehicle. I've got uh, YouTube is great. You can learn all kinds of things on YouTube about how to do it. So uh, the windows went out in my mother's Honda Element. She loves that car. They don't make it anymore, so she keeps it, even though it looks like a, it's about to fall apart. The windows went out. I got on YouTube. I figured out how to change the regulator, the motors and the regulators in the in the Element. But that's you know most people can't. Most people don't. I, I have an enormous amount of time. I'm a college professor, so I have nothing else to do with my life. You know, once I leave here at 11, go fix my mother's car, do something like that. Most people don't, don't have that time, and so they're going to have to rely on these things. And so when we present these arguments uh, about correlation, that Subaru is a safe car in, or in an accident, what is it that they have to back that up? And are they making ethically valid arguments? Complex questions. We oftentimes find these in marketing where we hit you with double barrel questions. Do you suffer from depression and anxiety? Well, those are not the same thing, are they? I, I can't remember which drug they're now giving for everything. It's yeah, depression, anxiety, smoking cessation, and weight loss. Are you depressed, anxious, and fat? Well, you know, I mean, that's one of the things that I think that was well butrin when it came out. The reason I'm one of the reasons I'm divorced. So at the time, my spouse decided that she was going to get on well butrin and quit smoking and also to lose weight and for depression. I just quit smoking. <laughs> wasn't a happy 
combination. But, you know, I mean, double barreled, you know, are, these are not the same things. Anxiety is not the same thing as depression. Depression is not, you know, be careful about how we, how we present these issues. I mean, should we claim, should we really be making claims um, for things like that, that, that may be, um, you know, difficult or tangential or secondary? So avoid those. That's a complex questions. Any questions about logic and critical thinking? All right, well, if you have questions, let me know. You can take an entire class. It's one of the few classes outside of my own classes that I recommend students take. But if you haven't taken your uh, humanities, I imagine that most of you have, although sometimes, from time to time, I have students that have waited because they just don't want to take that. It's boring, and they put it off until the last minute. Sort of the way I put off physical science, university physical science, until my last semester. Um, because I just thought that was horribly boring, like who cares? You know, I mean, I, I was not terribly concerned with the cosmos and what happens beyond, you know, our, our own little world here. So that just didn't interest me. Biology sort of interested me, but I would wait until the last minute to take physical science. So I know sometimes students wait. If you haven't taken all of your humanities, you should take logic and critical thinking accounts for one of them. And I think it's a, a good course for almost anybody. It's certainly good for sales majors because it teaches you how to really critically analyze a problem that your, that your um, prospective buyers may have and come up with solutions or ways of overcoming their resistance. Uh, so I think it's one of those that's really, really helpful. So now we get to talk about my favorite part of the class and students' least favorite part of the class, <laughs> which is ethical theory and business. Now, a lot of people argue, and in fact, I've written a paper in which I say that business ethics and marketing ethics in specific should be taught with a philosophical foundation. And one of the reviewers has come back, and they are very resistant to this argument that I've made because they've said that businesses don't have philosophers, and we should just teach it from a managerial perspective. And there are lots of problems with just teaching it from a managerial perspective. And there are lots of problems with assuming that you have to have just an advanced degree in philosophy to understand these things. I don't think that that's true. And the other thing that happens is whether we realize it or not, we all engage in philosophical discourse all the time, whether we recognize it or not. We all sort of have, people will ask you, for example, you know, at fashionable parties, what's your life philosophy? You hear people, you know, talk about this all the time. Well, my life's philosophy is. What is your life's philosophy? <clears throat> what is it that most people want? So these three great questions, we talked about this the last time or um, in one of the previous classes. Philosophy attempts to answer three great questions. What are they? The question of knowledge. What is it we can know and how can we know it? The question of governance, what is the right form of government? What's the best form of government? Last night, we had a, a little um, example of governance. The Iowa caucuses took place. So the Democrats, the Republicans didn't have a caucus in Iowa this year because they did away with them because Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. And so a lot of the states have said, why do we even bother having a, a caucus or a primary when we know who the... If you've got an incumbent president, they're almost always... So let's save ourselves the cost and expense and not go through the charade of pretending that we're going to have people um, that are not going to be the nominee. And so a number of states. Now, there's a debate about whether or not that's democratic, because there are people that are running for the for the presidency in the Republican side. Bill Weld, who is a Republican governor of Massachusetts, has decided he's going to throw his name in the ring to run against Donald Trump. He has about zero percent chance of actually winning the Republican nomination. But he's throwing his name in the ring. But they decided, you know, in Iowa, they're not going to have caucuses for the Republicans because, you know, the parties decided that, that Donald Trump is going to be the, the, the nominee. So the Democrats had 
their caucuses last night, and it turned out to be an unmitigated disaster because they they have started implementing new procedures in that process to deal with what were perceived as some of the, the problems with prior caucuses, right? And it turns out that they didn't think through this very well. And one of the things that they developed for this was an app. We just all love apps, don't we? We're just addicted to our apps. They're just, so they developed an app, and we have no idea who won the Iowa caucus as a result. You know, normally, in, in 2016, we knew who had won the Iowa caucuses by 10 o'clock in the evening. But they now developed this app. They can't figure out what's gone wrong. They're having to go back and recalculate all the data from each precinct by hand. And it's a big mess, and we're not going to find out who won the Iowa caucuses probably until later on today. If then, which is, that's that's not good for our democracy. Although there are lots of things. We're not a terribly democratic country if you really want to think about it uh, for very long. Um, but we, we had this little experiment in democracy last night at the Iowa caucuses. I'm sure most of you didn't watch it. We're going to have another little experiment in democracy tonight. Uh, President Trump will deliver his State of the Union address. Now, you all should watch the State of the Union address because fundamentally, this is a marketing statement. It is the president marketing himself to the nation. Historically, this is not what the State of the Union was. This is what it has become. And in the television era, it has become that on crack. But historically, what the State of the Union was, when George Washington delivered the first State of the Union, he didn't actually go to Congress. We think about, uh, we think about the president going to Congress into the chamber of the House of Representatives. And the reason they go to the chamber of the House of Representatives is because what? You all should know this from your American National Government class, which you took three and a half years ago and have no recollection of whatsoever. But uh, there's a reason that they always meet in the House chamber and not the Senate chamber, because... How many members are there of the United States House of Representatives? No. A, lot more. A lot more than the Senate. There are 435 members of the United States House of Representatives. There are two senators from each state, which means that we have 100 senators. So the Senate chamber is small. The House chamber is large, right? So they can get all of the people or most of the people that they need in there. So who participates in the State of the Union? In modern history, well, the Supreme Court comes over and they sit in the House chamber. There are galleries in the House chamber so that you know people sit up there. Sent the Senate comes in and they sit on the floor of the House chamber. So it's a much larger venue. It has to be done by invitation. The Speaker of the House has to invite the President. And last year, she almost didn't invite the president. But in modern times, we, we have the State of the Union delivered from the United States House of Representatives chamber with the Senate, the Supreme Court, the members of the president's cabinet, minus one, because as the presiding officer of the United States Senate, the vice president, that is the vice president's only real role in the Constitution is to preside over the United States Senate. He is the president of the Senate. So what you will see tonight is you will see the Speaker of the House, they put in two big ceremonial chairs, big high back leather chairs at the uh, at the dais of the House of Representatives. Nancy uh, Pelosi will sit in one and the Vice President of the United States will sit in the other, which is Mike Pence, right? And then you'll have the Supreme Court, the President's cabinet, minus one person. There's always one that they keep out in case something happens, like there's a bomb. There's even a TV show that's been made about this called Designated Survivor, right? Which lasted three seasons, I think. And um, it's about how Kiefer Sutherland, who is the secretary of like education, becomes president when the Capitol is blown up in a terrorist attack. So there's always one. That, by the way, is an even more modern phenomenon that happened after 9-11, that they started set aside having one member of the cabinet set out someplace at an undisclosed location in case we had to have a continuity of government. Because as you know from the United States Constitution, again, you should know this from your American National Government class. If the president is dead and the vice president is dead, who becomes president? Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. Well, she's going to be there, right? Because she's the presiding officer of the House. So she's going to be sitting there with the president and the vice president. So the top three people after the president or after the vice president um, and Speaker of the House, it goes to the president pro tempore of the United States Senate, which is 
uh, a guy named Chuck Grassley, who's the longest serving senator in the majority party. So it's currently Chuck Grassley would be the next one. Well, he'll probably be there, right? And then it goes into the cabinet, and it used to be by order of creation. But I think they've modified that now, so the, the succession goes somewhat differently. I think it, it still starts out with the first department that was created, which is state. Um, but they have they have advanced some of the lesser departments or what are viewed as lesser departments in favor of ones that they figure are more high profile. So there will be one person out there. Well, again, this is a very modern phenomenon. We did not start having these, and they did not use them as a sort of bully pulpit political spectacle until 1913 when Woodrow Wilson started the process or, or practice of going to Congress and delivering the State of the Union. Before that, when George Washington delivered his State of the Union, it was delivered by a, a letter, basically, and it basically was sort of a balance sheet approach to the state. You know, we took in this amount of money in taxes. We spent this amount of money, um, you know, we had this amount of money in tax revenue. We spent this amount of money on projects and things like that. It was, it was fairly cut and dry. Now it is a political event. So you should watch the State of the Union tonight because Donald Trump will lay out what he plans on doing you know, for this last year of his uh, first term of his presidency, at least in theory. Um, we'll see if he manages to stay on script or if he goes spinning off the rails and into to cuckoo land. Um, but, you know, this is a, an important thing, the question of governance, the question of conduct and the question of knowledge, right? So, well, one of the things that is a major question and obviously is important to marketing because why do we see all these ads for Abilify and Chantix and Wellbutrin and Prozac and Paxil on television? Well, I think it's because it, it touches on one of the fundamental questions that we have as human beings and we all philosophize about this question, which is what? Well, now what's what is what's the good life? What constitutes happiness? What 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 constitutes a, a life well lived? And you all do this, whether you think about it or not, don't you? Haven't you thought about this? What what is it that's going to make you happy? And as Americans, we have a tendency to turn to one thing. Not necessarily, it's called the American dream, yeah. right? That's, and there's this idealized image of what the American dream is. What is that image of the American dream? Well, forever and ever and ever, it generally involved a, a couple of things. There are similarities. Not everyone has the same dream, but there were some similarities, weren't there? We're a big country. So what's part of the American dream? Everybody wants to what? Uh, they want to own, well, not own a home. They want to own a home. Yeah, not everybody wants to own a business. Not everybody's that risk, uh, you know, prone. Most people are kind of risk adverse, but almost everybody wants to own a home in the United States. This is very different from other countries. When I was a foreign exchange student in Germany, nobody really thinks about owning a home because the, there's not a lot of land. And they're expensive. And generally, homes may be passed down through a family, which means that if you have more than one kid, somebody's not getting that home, right? The family that I was, that I lived with, they had a son, um, but, you know, I mean, they owned their home. It had been passed down to the father from his parents, and his brother had been, you know, basically passed out and had to go find his own. He didn't have a home. He rented an apartment in town that I lived in. He said, you know, it's, it's just not part of their thinking. They're a small country, not a lot of land, it's expensive, so that's not part of their dream. Right? And by the way, this idea of what we call the American dream is pretty atypical to a lot of, uh, when I was in Germany, nobody says, my German dream, <laughs> right? Now maybe the French do, because the French are very, very <laughs> self-existent, so they probably have the French dream, which is to you know, make everybody French. But this is pretty atypical to most other nations to say, you know, my great British dream. But in America, we say that. And this is, you philosophize, you know, what is it? And the American dream has changed. So historically speaking, it was everybody wanted to do better than their parents. They wanted to, have, to be able to buy a house, you know, have their own little plot of dirt and, and a home and kids and a family and a good job. Right? 
Now, the American dream is changing. There are lots of people that are saying things like, I don't want to have kids. My niece and her husband. My first wife and I said, we didn't want kids. Turns out she just didn't want kids with me. Because she went on to have kids. She always said she wanted kids. We got a divorce and she went to have kids. But, you know, lots of people, my niece and her husband have now said, I, they don't have kids. And I understand this. Because kids suck up a lot of resources. Right? But historically, that's what people wanted. They wanted to get married and have a family. That's changing. A lot of people are now saying, I, I, don't, I don't have kids. I don't have a career. I don't get to work. I want to make money. I want to travel the world. But this is all ecos of you philosophizing about what it is that makes you happy. What it is that you think is the good life. Right? And one of the things that is unique about America is that we basically say, that's okay. In lots of other parts of the world, they don't say that's okay. If you want to deviate from the norm. In Russia, if, if your good life is that you want to be gay, well, it's going to suck to be you. Because they still persecute homosexuality there, right? So um, we all philosophize about these things, and we should think about them. What is the good life? What is it that, that constitutes a life well lived? So one of the case studies that they talk about in business ethics, and it's talked about in your book somewhere, is executive compensation. This brings up issues of fairness, right? In 1960, the average CEO pay was 12 times the average factory worker. So you took the average of the people that are down there on the floor, bolting the tires on the Buick, and or putting in the engine or you know whatever it is that they're doing and, and it was 12 times by 1974 the average ceo pay had risen to 35 times the average factory worker in 1995 it was 135 times the average factory worker uh that was in 1995 in uh 2020 you want to guess how many times it is more than the average factory worker thousands thousands of times the average worker Company, company. What is what is the executive compensation package for you know, the CEO of Disney? Well, we got a glimpse of that when Roy Disney and a bunch of other people filed a lawsuit against Michael Eisner called the derivative lawsuit. Michael Eisner's package at that time, his compensation package, was five hundred thirty-five million. This was back. In the early 2000s, 535 million dollars a year. But hey, that's chunk change compared to Bill Gates, who's making how many how many billions a year? Or Jeff Bezos, who's now estimated to be the wealthiest man on the planet. And how much is he worth now? What's his net worth? 60 or 70. Oh, it's more than that. It's, it's closer to. Let's just look it up. He's trying to be next year, man. He's over my head. Well, <laughs> you know, you think that. You think that Tom Steyer is a billionaire, but he's not He's not Jeff Bezos. Uh, rich. Let's look. $123.9 billion. Billion, 123, 120, let's just wait, 124, right? Let's say Tom Steyer, who's running for president. Let's see what his net worth is according to Google. $1.6 billion, that's what Forbes says. Tom Steyer's worth $1.6 billion, so he's a billionaire. Wow, just downright poor. <laughs> 1.6 billion compared to Bezos, $124 billion. Grandchildren, grandchildren. You know, what about, uh, so what the guy who used to be, 
Um, number one. Bill Gates. Wow, he's suffering, isn't he? Old Jeff Bezos, whose employees are having to pee in Coke bottles because if they take time to go to the restroom, they get fired. Yeah, boy, that's a way to run a company, isn't it? These, this raises fundamental questions. Now, of fairness, doesn't it? I mean, we all, that's, I think, part of the American dream, too, historically, has been, I want to I want to be rich. I want to make a lot of money. Not everybody says that. But, you know, most people want to make a lot of money. Why do they want to make it? Because we all have needs. Right? We all want things, don't we? So we want to have a house. That's still, to this day, something like 95% of Americans say they want to. That's part of their American dream, is to own a home. And the homes that we want have gotten bigger and more extravagant. We no longer are satisfied with two bedrooms, or three bedrooms, two and a half baths. So historically, that was the model in the 1950s and 60s. You had, you know, three kids, and if you had two boys and a girl, the girl got her own room, the boys had to share a room, and every and all the kids had to share a bathroom. How many of you had to share a bathroom? Describe my family. Uh -uh. <laughs> you just describe my family. Well, that, that's not to, most most people anymore now. They know. God, do I get kids can't share a bathroom? Right. So, People get ready in time. It's hard. Everybody doesn't have their own bathroom, right? And so this idea of CEO compensation, well, if, if Bezos is worth, how much was it? $229 billion. You know, I mean, if he's making this amount of money, how is he making it? Well, I can tell you how part of it he's making it. I mean, he, he took this little internet startup company that he had, you know, he had this idea that was an internet startup company. And what was the idea? Well, we're going to have a marketplace for books. People like books. How many of you actually read books now? You know, because, because reading makes you sleepy. That's what my students tell me. When I, you know, I had a student last semester. I'm not doing very well on your, te on your test. Well, did you read the book? No, reading makes me sleepy. <laughs> well, you might want to start there. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, yeah. Start reading in the morning when you're first up. You know, get that, get that coffee, that caffeine jolt. So you know, Amazon starts as this business that basically sells books. Lots of people sell books online. Sounds like a good thing. Good thing for students. Cheap way to buy textbooks, right? It's transformed into so much more than that, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Amazon is now the world's largest retailer. They've surpassed Walmart. You know, that's the new thing. You can buy everything from Amazon. Well, and they they send it to you. What? How do you how do you? You order something from Amazon today, you're going to get it when? Two days. In two days. Sometimes tomorrow. Sometimes tomorrow. My groceries are coming today. Right? So you're ordering groceries on Amazon. And you get it in two days. From Whole Foods. For free. From Whole Foods. They go to Whole Foods. Yeah. Drive it to your house. Yeah, they've got all these Amazon, all these Amazon trucks. They're making a lot of money off of not paying their workers very well. Or if they do pay them well, comparatively. They're not treated very well, according to a lot of them. Again, I mean, I'm not making this up. There are people are peeing in bottles because, as I understand it, they have a forced uh, distribution, and the bottom of the distribution is, is fired automatically. If you're at the bottom, you're automatically gone of the distribution. So they force a distribution. What's a forced distribution? A lot of people call this, you've heard this term used, You'll ask when the grades come out on the first exam, do I curve the exam? Well, uh, no, I don't. 
necessarily, and most people don't. So what most students think of as a curve is, well, I'm, I'm going to add points, right? That's not really a curve. A curve is a normal distribution. That's what a curve is, forcing a distribution. They do this in law school. 5% of the people are going to get Fs in law school in every class. 5% are going to get As. And actually, it's a 12-point scale. So law school grade points are not 4 points. They're 12 points. An A plus is 12. An A is an 11. An A minus is 10, and so on and so forth. And they force this distribution on, on the class. 5% are going to fail. 5% are going to get As or A pluses. Right. Would you like it if I did that, if I forced a distribution? If I actually did grade on a curve, if I forced a normal, probably not. You'd probably complain. So they some of you would complain. Doesn't matter how brilliant you were, Grandpa, somebody's got to fail. They do that at Amazon. Unless they've changed recently because they've gotten such bad press over it. How's he making this amount of money? Well, he, he's making literally hundreds of thousands of times more. If he's worth, you know, $124 billion, he's making thousands of times more or hundreds of thousands of times more than the person who's pulling stuff in Amazon warehouses and getting it to you. Is that fair? Well, in a capitalist society, we sort of say that's, you know, I mean, he had this idea, he built this company, and if you don't like it, do what? Leave. Leave. Go, go work for somebody else. And in a booming economy, that may be an option. Unemployment is less than 5%. We generally now, I will tell you that that rate that they are calculating on unemployment is highly manipulated. And it's not just the Trump administration that's done this, it started with Ronald Reagan. He started manipulating the way we calculated unemployment. The way he was like, oh, well, these, there's all these people that are, that are unemployed but have stopped drawing benefits, unemployment benefits. So we're just going to stop counting in the employment numbers. Yeah, well, we're just going to stop counting them because it looks better. We're just going to say, you know, they, they've obviously just given up. They've retired. No, Ron, they haven't, you know. Just not drawing unemployment benefits, but we're going to calculate. So, you know, in a, in a in an economy in which the employment is pretty low, you may be able to, to do that, or maybe you won't, <clears throat> because although the economy and the economic indicators are pretty good, they're good for people who have skills and have some kind of knowledge base. Not so good for unskilled labor. So these bring up issues of fairness. Should we tax the wealthy more to pay for social services, to pay for schools and things like that? This has affected you. When I went to college, my family could afford to write the check for me to go to college. I think the check was less than $2,000 a semester for tuition and books when I went to college. It wasn't that long ago, and now I seem old. And I've been here a long time. I've been here for 27 long, suffering years, but you know, it still wasn't that that long ago. Now, you know, most of you have to take out loans. And why do you have to take out loans? Well, because the state is no longer paying a big portion of that. Why is the state not paying a big portion of that? Well, because we've given tax breaks as a society. We've said we we no longer. You can afford to do that. You're 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 going to make a lot of money when you get out of here, hopefully. Um, and so you can afford to do that. We need to give tax breaks to businesses so that they can grow their business or whatever. So these, these kinds of things bring up fundamental questions of fairness and justice that we talked about. So there are some challenges to philosophical ethics. And when we talked about what is your definition of justice, you should know these. What are these challenges to, to philosophical ethics? There are three of them. Two of them sound good. The third one doesn't sound good, but it's probably the hardest to deal with. The other two sound intuitively attractive, but they're very easy to dispense with if we think about them for more than about five minutes. The third one is harder to deal with. So the oldest or the first of these is subjectivism. This is the idea that there are no 
and you should know these terms for, and I've used the term before, for an exam, a priori truths. Subjective is to say there are no a priori truths. What are a priori truths as opposed to a posteriori? A priori knowledge is knowledge that can be gained from the rational mind without reference to external events or experience. What is an example of a priori truth that can be gained from the rational mind? Oops, I'm not over here. Artists today, well, if you have a rectilinear triangle, a right angle triangle, and this side is three and this side is four, the third side has to be, this should come tripping off your tongue. The third side has to be what? No. It's a squared plus b squared equals c squared, which means that if this one is four, what's four squared? Sixteen. What's three squared? Nine. What's that give you? Twenty-five. What's the square of twenty-five? Okay. Five. <coughs> Who came up with this? It's the Pythagorean theorem, yeah. Did Pythagoras go around, so he's an ancient Greek. Did he go around drawing triangles in the dirt to figure this out? No. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't go around. And it's nice if it's three, four, five. It gets more complicated, right? Yeah. No, he didn't. I can tell you. You can see this in the mind's eye. This is knowledge you only have to think. Now, it helps that he's a genius, right? I mean, it, it helps that Pythagoras was, was a mathematical genius. But he didn't, he could see it in his mind's eye. He knew it a priori without reference to experience. This is true in space. It's true in all places at all times. And this is useful. How is the Pythagorean theorem useful? Well, we can use it in all kinds of building of things to figure out stuff. You can know this a priori without reference. You can see it in the mind's eye. And that's how he didn't go around drawing triangles in the dirt or on papyrus or whatever the hell it was that the ancient Greeks had. I guess it was papyrus. Didn't do that. A posteriori knowledge is knowledge that we have to experience to learn. What's that? Well, I hope although I'm finding out more and more that as students, you know, I mean, like when I was a kid growing up in the uh, 1980s, we had video games, but compared to the video games that you all have today or that I have on my phone, they were <laughs> rather simplistic and stupid. So I had a Let's see, I had a Nintendo, I had an Atari. You probably all have never heard of these. Have you heard of Atari? Have you ever heard of Nintendo? Sure. Maybe Nintendo. They did use it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what did I have before Nintendo? And then television or something? I, 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 I you know, it's been a long time. Those games were very simplistic compared to the games that I can play on my phone. Some of the games that I play on my phone are probably very simplistic to what you all are playing, I'm sure. My nephew is constantly playing with his friends all over the neighborhood. They don't ever get together anymore. Like everybody just gets on their you know, gaming headphones and their webcams and play Call of Duty or 
Fortnite or yeah. who's the airsoft guns? I mean, so I, 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 I don't I, think all those the stuff, stuff, right? I mean, like, you've got all the stuff, to, but um, when I was growing up, you know, the first video game that came out was called Pong. Basically, it was you just tried to keep a ball going, it was kind of like a tennis match. Then I really thought we were doing something when we got um, Pac Man. Probably some of you have actually played Pac Man. It's actually kind of a fun game um, to play. You know, it's got little ghosts, and these little ghosts try to chase the little man who's eating the dots, and you get killed by the ghost. Uh, then we got some more uh, advanced games. Uh, Frogger, that was, oh yeah, I love Frogger. There was one that I really loved that was not very popular, which you all probably never heard of, called Joust. I think you can actually get a version of it now. So Joust was you rode ostriches, but the ostriches could fly, and you tried to knock off the other person while flying on the ostrich. And to do that, you either had to hit them with your lance, or you had to land on top of them before they landed. It was, it was a great game. But we actually had to ride bikes because that was, you know, like our parents would say things like, turn off that television and go outside. Anymore, I find students that don't actually, you know, I've had several students that don't and they never know what that was. But we actually rode bikes. Anybody just jump on the bike and know how to ride it? Anybody just jump on and like, we're instantly good at this? You are, seriously. A bike? Yeah. You just yeah. jumped on the bike and we're well, I, I, was, I never fun. had training wheels on mine. So I, you had never yeah. fell in the initial, no, like, I didn't have training wheels. My parents didn't do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just remember, the, like, the first time I ever rode one, we just, well, my dad just put me on, like, the hill that we had. And I, I didn't crawl, but I made it to the house. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Most people, it's a learning experience. You have to experience it. You have to understand. You have to, uh, it's a feel that you get in terms of the balance. Right? It's not something that you just know a priori, like, like the, the uh, Pythagorean theorem. You have to experience this to know it. When you start driving a car, you have to experience it to get it. Particularly if you grew up like I did. I grew up on a, on a ranch. Um, well, I grew up here in Oklahoma and then spent the summers on my father's cattle ranch in northern New Mexico. And um, it's amazing to me. We never had automatic tra trucks. Did not have automatic transmissions. They were all standard transmissions because you, if you wanted to pull anything that was very heavy, you had to have a standard transmission. Now they've made automatic transmissions so efficient and so much better that you can't get a truck, a big truck. So I drive a Dodge Ram Dually, um, a 3500. You can't get that in a standard. They now all come with automatic transmissions because it's so much more efficient that the towing capacity has gotten so much greater. But that was not true when I was growing up. They had not gotten to that advanced state. So you had to learn how to drive a standard, which meant anybody of you know how to drive a standard? A couple of you know how to drive a standard? Uh, you have to, that's something you have to figure out, right? The first time you do it, that clutch thing, you probably kill it. You know, if you were like me, you, you, you pop the clutch, and it, you know, didn't get the gas quite right and it goes, right? So you have to experience these things. Well, what subjectivists do, and the argument they make is that, look, ethics are so complex and the realm of human experience is such that you can never really know anything from an ethics standpoint a priori. You have to figure it out a posteriori because we're all so different and unique that there are no universal truths that we can discern. Ethics is up to the individual. Now this seems intuitively appealing. Because if we think about things like executive compensation, I'm sure there are some of you that are in here that are like, yeah, I, I don't think we ought to tax Jeff Bezos a whole lot of money because well, I'm going to be rich one of these days. I've heard that argument all my life in Oklahoma. Oklahomans love that argument. I'm going to be rich one of these days. Yeah, the evidence is no, you're not. 
I was one of those people. They used to do the Vista, the, they used to be, students actually used to read the school newspaper, there's this little newspaper, it still comes out, I think. Is it still around? Like, yeah, you know, but the students actually used to read it. Like, you know, said that was so funny. what? used to read it. Yeah, I mean, the students used to read this. It was kind of entertaining, I guess. But, you know, this used to do the survey every fall where they'd go around campus and they'd ask people, well, where do you think you're going to be when you're 30? And 95% of our students would say, well, I'm going to be a millionaire. I, I, was one of, I was one of those students that said that. We, we see how it's turned out. Poorly, right? Uh, you know. Um, so the evidence is you're not going to be a millionaire. Sorry. But, you know, if, if I asked you all about, you know, should we tax the hell out of Jeff Bezos, I'm sure somebody would say, oh, no, no, that stifles ingenuity. It stifles free enterprise. We need to let the entrepreneurs flourish and thrive. That's what a market economy is all about. And I'm sure some of you would say, hell no. We have a healthcare system that's broken. Yeah, we ought to tax them. You know, on the other side, tax the hell out of it so that we can pay for, for Medicare for all. Right? I mean, these are tough questions. So subjectivism is intuitively attractive. Let's take something that's even more emotionally problematic besides taxing. I mean, Americans, over, like, this whole tax thing, by the way, we're the only country that has this whole tax heartburn problem. Right? I mean, every other country on, on the planet is pretty socialistic. We're the only ones that are this capitalistic, right? Every other country is, is more socialistic than we are. Um, and they don't seem to have this heartburn with taxes that we do in this country. There's probably a reason for that. Probably part of the reason that we, we have this problem is because we aren't like Germany, where people live, as I told you, in small places and they have to rely on people. I mean. In the United States, every time we got to a little too crowded, what do we do? Well, we moved. And if you don't like your neighbors, I can tell you that's one of the reasons people move. They decide that I can't stand these people. I am gonna move out. Or I can, you know, I can set up my skunk works. Do what I want. Let's take something even more controversial, abortion. This is a marketing topic, right? Students talk about what is abortion after? Well, you pay for it. It's it's provided, right? You, you're, you're paying for it uh, as a service, or some people do. Um, should we spend tax money on it, right? Should we give to Planned Parenthood? So, you know, if I start asking questions about abortion like that, I'm sure we're going to have all kinds of different opinions in here. Everything from you should have abortion on demand to no abortion ever. Now, the vast majority of Americans settle somewhere in the middle, don't they? What do most people say? Most people say, yeah, I don't really like abortion, but, you know, I'm not willing to tell a woman what she can do, at least within the first three months. That's what most people say. Like, you know, within the first three months, okay. After that, I'm getting a little queasy about it, you know, but... That's a really hard issue. So subjectivism seems attractive, but the problem with it is that if we accepted subjectivism as true, well, we could never come up with rules and we can find subjectivists say there are no a priori truths. There are at least three rules that we have found in the anthropological and historical record that, have, that all societies have said, these apply at all places at all times. What are those three prohibitions that we find in all places at all times? Um, and we can discern more a priori, I think, than this, but the ones that we can find at least in, in all societies from the very primitive to our advanced are all societies have a prohibition against killing members of the in group. No society allows for the indiscriminate killing of members of the in group, right? Every now, most of us have gotten more sophisticated and we, as societies have advanced, and we extend those, those, those protections to even members of the out group. All societies, you know, say you can't indiscriminately kill members of the in group. In the United States, we no longer say that you can kill members of the out group. Right? It's, it's 
not permissible. What do I mean by members of the opt group? Well, when the Canadians come across the border, as they want to do, because it's cold up there in Canada, they like Florida in January. If you've ever been to Canada in January, it's a horrible place, miserable. And they vacation a lot in, in Florida. Well, we don't allow those Floridians to just, you know, kill the Canadians, do we? <laughs> and, no, we don't. So we, we extend that. All societies have had a prohibition against stealing, at least for members of the in group. Now, there are societies that are more communal, and you have to acknowledge that. But, you know, every society, even the most communistic, or the most communal have some idea of ownership of some things, you know, at least their clothing or their beads or things like that. So there's a rather sweet movie that highlights this that follows the little song people. It's, it's a really old movie now. They used to show it in school when I was a kid. I bet you haven't seen it. It's called The Gods Must Be Crazy. Have any of you seen this movie or heard about this movie? Usually I've had one student every semester that has seen this. Their, their parents make them watch it or something like that. You can get it on YouTube probably. So in The Gods Must Be Crazy, what happens is this, this airplane is flying over um, a portion of sub-Saharan Africa where the little San people live. And they're a communal society. They share almost everything except, you know, like their necklaces and their, their clothing and things like that. But everything else is shared. And this pilot drops out from his window a Coca-Cola bottle. And this turns out to be like the root of all evil for these little San people because they only have one of them. You know, everything else they pretty much share communally, but now all of a sudden they've got this rare good that, that is pretty useful. So it's an old fashioned, the movie was made in the 1970s, I think. So it's an actual Coca-Cola bottle. You know, like you can buy these now. They, they sell them in the stores, sort of novelty products. But at the time when I was growing up, they didn't, and not everything was plastic. They had Coca-Cola bottles. And in fact, you put them back. You got a Coca-Cola bottle out of the machine, and they would have crates next to the to the Coca machine for you to put the Coca-Cola bottle back in. Um, and you got in most states, you got to you had to pay a deposit on the bottle, and then they would give you the deposit back when you took it back into the store. So this pilot throws out this Coca-Cola bottle, and all of a sudden, these people figure out that it's really useful for a lot of stuff, right? The women figure out that they can use it as kind of a mallet to mash stuff, to make food. The men figure out that they can use it for something else, and, and it creates a lot of problems. So the chief of the tribe tries to get rid of the bottle, and it keeps coming back, and it's, it's kind of a funny story. They live very communally, but even in that communal setting, there are prohibitions against you. don't walk up to somebody and snatch their, uh, their puka shells or whatever it is that they're wearing. You know, you, you respect that. So there's a prohibition against stealing. The third is there's always a prohibition in all societies and all places and all events against bearing false witness against a member of the in group. Now, of course, you can lie about members of the out group, but you can't lie about members of the in group. As we become more advanced, we we basically said you can't do that. You know, you can't go into court and say that Canadian over there, you know, he ran into me and caused great bodily harm, and of course we shouldn't believe him because he's Canadian, and what do they know about driving? Uh, you know, they live in the tundra. We, we've extended that, but we found three. So if we can find one, we can dispense with this idea that there are no a priori truths. What are some of the things that we can know that you don't have to experience to know that it's probably just wrong? Well, let's take the first prohibition, the prohibition against killing members of the interval. Well, nobody wants to die, do they? For the most part, very few people want to die. Most people want to live. And they will go on living even in abhorrent conditions and clinging to life in the most abhorrent of conditions. This is highlighted in a book called Candide by Voltaire. Voltaire thought of this book as being a a rather, you know, quick little tome that he put out. You can read it in one sitting. Often, from time to time, students ask me, you know, what is it that I should read if I want to become truly educated? And Candide is on that list uh, of books that you should read to, to become truly educated. You can read Candide 
in one sitting. Um, Voltaire was, he considered himself to be a philosopher, although he wasn't, not in the same way that Aristotle or Plato are philosophers or uh, um, even from Voltaire's era, um, Rene Descartes or, or Jean-Jacques Rousseau, but he considered himself to be a philosopher. He was what we might think of as a public intellectual today, and he put out this, this story. It's not a novel in the traditional sense, called Candide. And it's about Candide and all of his misadventures and trying to get back with the woman that he loves, whose name is Cunegon. So Candide starts out, he's a citizen in uh, Westphalia, which is a German state under the, in the fictionalized book, under the barren thunder tan trunks. And we're told that this place is so wonderful in Candy that the castle the Baron lives in even has a window or a door and a couple of windows. Candy gets kicked out of Westphalia and this paradise uh, for experiencing carnal knowledge with the Baron's daughter, whose name is Cunigon. And he literally gets kicked out of paradise with powerful kicks on his rear end. And he spends the rest of the book trying to get back with his beloved Cunigan. At one point in time, he and Cunigan are actually reunited, and they come across an old woman. And the reason I tell you this story is it highlights this idea of how much we cling to life. And they start telling their tales, and all of them have got these tales. They've gone through horrible things. And trying to get back with Cunigan, uh, Candide has been thrown out of Westphalia, and he's gone on these adventures. At one point, he ends up in the New World, in El Dorado, and there's so much gold lying around in El Dorado that people literally just leave it down on the streets and he packs up some burrows and um, goes back and tries to get back with Cunigan. But in these uh, series of events, he experiences a lot of misfortune. And so they all start trying to tell their story of misfortune. And, um, Candide goes through his and Cunigan goes through hers. And this old woman whose nose is so long that it touches her chin and her ears are so big that they, they look like Dumbo. And it turns out she has only half of a butt because she was captured by pirates. And in order to survive a storm and a shipwreck, they carp off half of her rear end and eat it. And she says, if you had seen me in my younger life, I didn't always look like this. I wasn't old and ugly where my nose touched my chin, which by the way, your nose, because it's made of cartilage, is one thing that in your ears continue to grow throughout your entire life, which is why old men have big noses and big ears, because your ears, is, is, they're not bone, and your nose continue to grow throughout your entire life. So you'll get bigger, you know, eventually touch your chin. And she tells her story. It turns out that this old woman was the daughter of a pope. Needless to say, popes aren't supposed to have daughters, right? They're supposed to be celibate. And she was betrothed to a prince. She was a princess. And as she was being sent off to meet her, her prince charming, she got captured on the ship by pirates who took her prisoner and then they enslaved her. And she went through all of these things. And at the end, she says, and yet through all of this that I've suffered, all of the indignities and walking through life and pain and misery from having been enslaved and having only half a butt, I went on loving life. And in fact, in all of my travels and all my misfortunes, I've only known three people who have actually taken their lives. And that's true. We, we go on clinging to life. Most of us want, even in, in dire conditions, to cling to life. So you don't have to, you don't have to experience death to know that you probably don't want, don't want it. You know this a priori, that you want to live. Even people who are horribly depressed, the vast majority of them don't take their own lives. They continue to cling to life and hope for something better. So we can find at least one thing that's true, or three things that are true at all places at all times, which dispenses with, with subjectivism. The second form of relativism that's very difficult to deal with is cultural relativism. This is the one that we see used by businesses a lot as arguments for things that, that they that they want to do. 
Cultural relativism says, well, now look, we, we, we can't all have our own idea of what morality is. If we did, it would be mass pandemonium. If, if I couldn't say it's immoral for me to shoot you, then we couldn't form a society and it, it would just be chaos, right? So we, we can at least come up with this idea that, that I shouldn't shoot you. I have, from time to time, students who have written on my student evaluations in the past, you're not funny. Yes, I, yeah, I am. <laughs> I, and if you fall asleep in my class because I'm funny, I, I'm morally offensive or offended by that, you know, like, Justice should be swift. I have a concealed carry permit. I should be able to take out my gun and just smite you right there. There would be no, it would only take one, right? I, I would only have to sacrifice one of you and nobody would fall asleep in my class ever again. It would be a beautiful thing, right? So, so beautiful. Happy days for me. But no, I can't do that. So there are prohibitions against my, my doing that. But cultural relativists say, look, okay, so we got these three, but cultures do very widely. And what's acceptable in Oklahoma may not be acceptable in other places. And so we have to take knowledge of, of the culture. So ethics is not about the individual, but rather for the cultural relativist, ethics is about one's culture. This leads to a theory, and it was adopted by a man named William Rehnquist, who used to be the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court before John Roberts, called legal positivism. And what this says is that you look to the law or the culture in which you are. And criminal law, by the way, is where it is where we codify how we feel about things as a society. So forever and ever and ever until a case called Lawrence and Gardner versus Texas in 2004, until that case, every state in the United States had prohibitions in their criminal code against homosexual sodomy. Gay sex bad, straight sex good. Now, obviously, very few people were ever prosecuted under these statutes, right? But that's where we... We said as a society, we, we don't like that. We're going to criminalize it. Okay. And in 2004, the United States Supreme Court said, mm, no. That is violative of the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. So I'm out of time. We'll talk about this some more next time. We'll talk about psychological egoism. I did pass a roll sheet, right? Yeah, it's back to you. Make sure that you signed it. Yes, let me do that. Let me turn this off so that I'm not.